Um, greetings, everybody. Um, my name is Agri Aguata, um, the short version of it. And I am, um, today I'm the facilitator with the Counter Memory Activism Research Group. Um, I would like to begin by acknowledging that most of my audience and our audience today are in Jipuktuk, uh, Mikmaki, the current and historically unceded, the current and historically unceded territory of the Mi'kmaqi people. This territory is covered by the treaties of peace and friendship, which Mi'kmaqi Wala Stakwik, I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing them well, uh, and Malasit uh, Pasa Makwadi, people's first signed with the British crown in 1726. Uh, I would also like to extend gratitude to the ancestors of this land, as well as the lands which you come from. Counter memory activism is an interdisciplinary research creation project between artists, museologists, curators, and scholars of genocide and memory studies, exploring the current uh, questions and the historical context of memory activism, as well as broader themes such as collective memory and uh, commemoration of heritage and difficult histories. This research project has been funded by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, SSHRC, or SHAC, Insight Development Grant. This project is a partnership between the Nova Scotia College of Art and Design and the University of King's College in Jipuktuk, Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. Tonight's event will consist of a speaking portion and a question period. Questions can be taken by, by viewers through the chat feature, but they will only be visible to the moderator who will then uh, pose selected questions to the speaker. <laughs> Our next speakers are uh, Sylvia D. Hamilton. That's on uh, Wednesday, next week, April 14th, 2021. Uh, the rest of the schedule for the speaker series can be found at the countermemoryactivism.ca. I'll repeat that, countermemoryactivism.ca or Facebook and Instagram at Counter Memory Activism. Uh, tonight's speaker is Wamboi Kamiru Kolimo. Um, and now um, Wamboi is, is a Kenyan born artist. Uh, she's raised in Kenya. Um, she's worked, um, her work is alongside decoloniality, understand that's decolonial work. And she will, she will touch more on herself when she starts speaking. And now let me introduce to you Wamboi Kamiru Kolimo. Wamboi. Thank you, Agri. Um, my name is Wamboi Wamai Kamiru. And my name as an act of resistance against mental colonialism. Kenya was colonized by the British, and as part of the campaign to erase memory, English were a mark of rebirth under what the civilization. My mother resisted this erasure of memory, and it is this spirit of resistance. That, uh, that's, I have to say, this is my first time uh, presenting work on Zoom, so bear with me as I figure my way around it. So my work is heavily influenced by my educational background. Um, I was a researcher um, and my work focuses on memory and with specific reference to Kenya's independence war. Um, I'm, I'm interested right now in exploring topics about being Kenyan, being African and being black. And my main themes in my work are history. 
Uh, I create what one may call installations for lack of a better name. Uh, but my work is often temporary and site specific and it fills a space. And basically what it means is that I give an experience of uh, for the audience in a particular room and I use their memories to generate their experience of my artwork. I use the six basic human senses, that being uh, touch, sight, hearing, smell, taste, and, and uh, what is known or where your body is placed within the, the artwork. I'm interested in scale and repetition, but mostly I enjoy the memories that uh, my work invokes in the audience and the conversations. So often my work is interactive in that when you are in the space, you can move things around, you can sit, um, often you can meditate within that particular space. And since the work is research-based, it takes about a year or two to develop. And my key artistic influences right now are Tanya Bruguera, uh, TJ Tijing Se, and uh, Pascal Martin Tayu, as well as a Kenyan artist by the name Shiwi Kiambi. My first installation, and I think probably my favorite installation is Harambe 63. And in it, basically in the gallery space, I recreated the bar. So this is a regular gallery. Um, and I took in items that you'd only find a local bar in Kenya and set it within a period of time being around 19, uh, 1950. and that within uh, a church. So this particular work is set in a bar and, and the audience can come in, have a seat, pull up a chair. Uh, what you'll see inside it are what I call storytelling objects. So all my work has got uh, storytelling objects. And in it, you have gumboots with graffiti on the side of them. Now graffiti has a history of resistance. And so I chose the faces of 63 um, Pan-Africanists or revolutionaries, people who led um, movements against the oppression of black people locally and globally. So what I was trying to do with this is that I was trying to set the Mao Mao war within the Pan-Africanist movement. Um, let's see if I can get you a picture of the gumboots here. Right here, you can see that there is a face there and that's Thomas Sankara and he was on the right side of the boot and each boot had a color representation. So it was either uh, a red ribbon for revolutionaries who led a bloody war or a black ribbon for theorists because I think to be part of a revolution, you need to have two things. You need to have the thinkers and you have to do, have the doers. And in this particular case, I was asking people uh, whose boots they stand in. So you could pick boots and you could evolution. So for example, in this particular case, it would be pangas or machetes or what, whatever you want to call them. Um, Kenya is one of the largest exporters of gumboots. And when you think of revolutionary wars on the African continent, the uniform is usually uh, bought in particular cases of this time, it was bought from the Soviet Union, as it was called at that particular time. But then the footwear was often um, gumboots. And even now today in guerrilla movements, which you'll find is that gumboots are the ones that are used. They also have a history from um, Belgian colonialism. So when we talk about counter memory, counter memory activism, my work in particular is about creating an alternative story. So often what you read when it comes to Kenyan history and when it comes to Mau Mau is that it was a band of bandits or terrorists, uh, they were disorganized. And what I was trying to show in this particular work is that, um, someone is sharing their screen, is that the, the, the movement was well organized and because it was well organized there was writing about it oh that's me i'm sharing the screen i'm sharing the screen Wembley, because i don't think we can see the images so i'll just maybe share your screen while you talk is that okay oh you can no no yeah so that's maybe, fine so maybe i'll just do the share the screen share while you talk is that okay oh you can all right, all right hang on let me see 
Let me go back. This is not the excitement we were setting ourselves for. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, how about, how about uh, you can see the images that are on screen yeah, right now, right? I can. So you just tell me I, I when can. to switch slides, okay? I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll do that, all right? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Um, so I guess the next slide after that. Um, and the next one after that, and we can discuss the, the stencils. So in the stencils, I chose uh, people for, who had changed the world, who were changing the world or had changed the world around uh, the freedoms of black people. So you've got Angela Davis, uh, you've got uh, Stokely Carmichael, Robert Mugabe, uh, John F. Kennedy and Miriam Makepa. So the, now I was trying to show the duality of character when it comes to uh, revolutionaries, because at one point, point in history, these people were either terrorists or they were heroes. Um, and it was about opening up the conversation about uh, how who had fought against the oppression of Black people. Next slide. So then, and that presents speeches from liberation from colonialism and racism and refers to histories of uh, black and colored people. So that's the bartender feeding you the, the propaganda as it was called in that. This feed was also shown in uh, Denmark and it's been shown in South Africa um, in different iterations. Let's see the next slide, please. In this particular one, I uh, worked on the, the, I lifted the stencils off of the gumboots and made these posters that are reminiscent of uh, communism posters. Uh, next slide. And then I use the posters later in public art. A landmark election in that we had the first election, then we had a, refer uh, a rerun, a rerun of the election because the, the results, the first results were disputed. So at the point where we're going to have a rerun, I, I got these posters across different densely populated areas like Congo, and the they look like the political posters that you would see for politicians um, who were vying in these particular areas. And what I did is I put the, the faces of these revolutionaries in uh, up against these posters so that you could get. Leaders based on these that had for us that had fought for the oppression of black people, fought against the oppression of black people, and against poverty on, on the African continent. Next slide. So your name betrays you, which is a 2015 installation was about ethnicism. And in it, I referenced the work of Terence Stranger who basically had in one of his papers made the, the history of uh, so that ethnicism is, um, is dynamic and that it initially came with missionary descriptions. And I lived in that and I said, so how did we as a nation, as a Kenyan country, um, come up with all the different ethnic groups? And you know, when you read about data in Kenya, it says we have got 42 ethnic groups. When I started to do the research, I found out that we had over 106 the cluster. A pigeonhole. So on the left of the work, you will see a chest of drawers. And these chest of drawers is actually like a library system. And in them are cards that ask about the how when the missionaries first came to the African continent, they needed to classify the people in order to differentiate them. Um, and it, it was it was building up on descriptions that explain had to the African continent. So 
there is an ethnic group that the explorers came across and they said this is a fierce group of people um, and they put red ochre on their hair and then the missionaries came with the education campaign and they found that this group of people that explorers had found the fierce and red ochred people were uh, were not interested in education because they were nomadic and therefore the missionaries turned them as not interested in education and the colonialists came through and said, OK, we need people who will defend our houses. And the explorer said that they're a fierce group of people. And they're not, the missionary said they're not interested in education. Therefore, they'll not be interested in climbing up the uh, social ladder. They take this ethnic group. And after we come in and we say, oh, uh, Maasai is not like education they wear red ochre and they are a fierce group of people and they make began from the point of colonialism have evolved through to the point where we are today and i was raising questions as to whether or not uh, we actually understand how these stereotypes have come about and what country division Next slide, please. This is off of the back that in 20, 2007, 2008, we had what is often termed as uh, post-election post violence. Um, and the post-election violence led to a lot of bloodshed. And often the papers, it would say that the election violence was, was coming about because of a fight between the Kikuyus and the Luos. And I prefer to think the fight came about mainly because of uh, resources, the lack of resources. Um, so in the, on the left of the work, you see the first image and in it is a, a, a large chair. And this large chair uh, represents the idea of, of ethnic division coming through the generations. In the middle, you have work by uh, Boniface Mwangi, uh, a photographic book about the post-election violence, and next to which you have a book about the classification of Africans. And in the same way that you have classifications of animals, you also have classifications of ethnic groups, just like there were animals with the different characteristics related to them. On the left are stereotypes that I collected from um, different groups of people. And what I realized is that people have all these stereotypes, but they're not willing to discuss them openly. So I had separate individuals and I collected about 136 stereotypes, which range from um, Cumbers, uh, good in bed, or uh, Kikuyu's are thieves, things that would be volatile or would cause volatility in terms of um, descriptions for people. Next slide, please. I also did video in this particular work. Uh, the, the, I, I referenced videos from uh, uh, the, the coronation and also lifted and in it, I showed transition from of Kenya. And it was about who was performing the ritual who was performing the stereotype, um, the, you know, the queen, the queen's sister arriving and in it she's got the carriage and she's waving with her little uh, glove, white glove, and she's going to um, the Anglican church and she's paying tribute to these uh, natives as they were referred to. And then these natives would perform a dance. And then later on at the point of uh, Kenya's independence, the same natives were performing for the president. And this, at this point, he was performing for the people with all the particular rituals that come with being president. Um, and how this video worked is that I layered the stereotypes against the video. So if you went and you tried to read the, the cards, if you tried to read this type of mem memory, how uh, Africans uh, in Kenya are remembered, then you got dizzy. You actually had to step back and when you step back, you realize it was a, all a performance of ritual, sort of like, you know, what comes first? Is it that the stereotypes come first and the people behave that way, or do the people behave that way and then the stereotypes um, arise from that? Next slide, please. 
So I don't always just discuss political history. I also discuss my own memories. Um, and in this work, I was, uh, I, I stopped the time at 3.23 when a woman was deciding whether to walk out on her marriage or not. So the room holds um, all the emotions and memories that the woman is processing on that night before she moves out. It presents her current state against the backdrop of her past life, exposing the extremes of love and loss. Um, and then divorce is looked down was is looked down upon in Kenya, or at least when this particular woman, uh, the artist who was going through it, down upon. And so there, there are references to uh, particular quotes that have been shared, like "divorce is not for quitters," and uh, the woman is the neck that turns the head of the household, who is the man. And therefore, you know, if a house fails, it is because of the woman. There is in this room elements from that particular relationship so all sorts of things uh, images from wedding from wedding uh, a cup of tea that had been consumed but then had not been cleared up and it basically shows uh, a sort a level of disarray and shows that this is something that the, the, the woman in this particular story had been going through. Uh, I then asked the audience to write their own thoughts about what they would tell this particular woman. And it gave the audience an opportunity to have a conversation about their own relationships, their own love and loss. So uh, next image, please. There you see an unused, uh, a used packet, an unfinished packet of biscuits, a book about raising children, a bottle of alcohol, key, keys, spare keys to the house, Panadol. Uh, next, next image, please. So the audience was then allowed to. I'm also interested in how uh, social media plays into our perceptions of identity. So those, Im those the images of the thoughts by the audience were then shared online using a hashtag. I sometimes like to play with my artwork. I sometimes like to play with my artwork in a way that uh, allows the two to, to, to merge. So the real life and what we call, what I call online disidentity, uh, social media. So, these quotes were collected and shared uh, anonymously. Next slide, please. Akile Binuele is an installation of our perceptions of femininity and beauty. And it looks at perceptions of African beauty with relation to hair. Uh, a new hierarchy is emerging where femininity is measured by the length of one's hair, one's head, one's hair on their head. Uh, and in Kenya, human hair from Brazil, Peru, India, China, Mongolia, and more, more recently Russia, is seen as a status symbol. So I realize there's a hierarchy as well when it comes to hair. So if you had the whiter the hair you had, the more expensive it was. So the more expensive being Russian hair, you go down the line until you get to, ironically, uh, Chinese hair when it comes to human hair. And I was interested in the idea that a feminine woman has long flowing flappable hair and this particular work refers to built environment and urban area so the idea that when you're from an urban area you tend to look a particular way you tend to look like your hair is slicked back and not as crazy and, and ragged as it would naturally be i picked a pink room because i wanted to demonstrate how uh, femininity could be so jarring or ideas around femininity or expectations around femininity can be so jarring. So in this particular work, I used commercials that referred to Barbie, uh, that referred to long hair and when, where it concerns black people. And then I created a carpet made from hair weave, which you can see on the floor in the middle of that picture. What I found out is that in Kenya, we we have long life hair. So basically you, you buy the hair, you put it on your hair, and then it's thrown out. There are people whose job it is to go through the trash who then collect that hair, it's re-sewn, and then it's re-sold again. 
And then once that gets really old, it gets stuffed into uh, cushions, which then inspired the idea that is the hair attractive just when it's on your head? Because as soon as I put the hair in a carpet, people were uh, averse to touching the carpet and you'd find people walking around the carpet or, and, and I had specifically requested that you could take off your shoes and actually put your feet on the carpet. And I, I was playing with the, the work. It's work that I will also be presenting again in, uh, in July. Next slide, please. Uh, you can see that there are Barbies in the middle image. And what I did is I went to one of the secondhand markets here uh, where many children have their first experience of a doll. And I took need to go to the market, sorry, and collected all these Barbies that had already had a first life with children in Europe and the US, and we're not going to have a second life with children in Kenya. And what I realized is that I'm a girl, and I wondered how this uh, affects or it gets into the perspective of children from a young age that their hair needs to be a particular way. Next image, please. So I'm developing this work. Um, the larger work will be in July. It will include a performance element. This particular character in the work um, is borrowed from a, a more real This work, I, um, I was looking at the work of a Cuban artist by the name of Susan Pillay. And you know, a woman's a woman's relationship with her own hair, with her own natural um, extensions, which is what I had looked at in the first part of this particular work. Next slide. Pray for us as we reply for it, delete or archive. This particular work refers to our experience of grief. Uh, as we experience it online. So uh, the pieces borrow a lot from Catholicism and the idea of repetitive prayer to ask for deliverance and forgiveness. Uh, the candles in the niches and supplication before each niche uh, is, is, is in relation to that particular practice. It regards to uh, how as a planet and as a nation of social media use images of brutality so you get you know we social media has has delivered bad news to us but you get so much bad news every day that at some point you become numb to it and i wanted to pay tribute to these five children who i met online through social media and kenya and to create novellas for them by placing screen grabs on plexiglass uh, in the way that they're presented to us on, on mobile phones. And I wrote letters to these children and in them I asked for forgiveness because I felt at the time that when we become so immune to the pain of, of, of the brutality that is in this world, we move through it and we, it, it just becomes normal. And I want to ask for forgiveness this way. The work is called reply, uh, Pray for Us as Reply for Delete or Archive because that's what you do when you either you do it or you forward it to your WhatsApp group or you delete it or you archive it for future reference. The work is based on Kubler uh, Ross's Death and Dying. It looks at the idea of grief as a stage uh, process. It looks at bargaining heavily from uh, Marian devotion and the idea of intercession, which is related to Catholicism. Next slide, please. So that's what the novella looked like. And when the screen grab was taken, so the time of day, there's a particular screen grab where there is uh, a, a symbol, um, an Islamic symbol for call to prayer. 
And at that time, I, um, I had taken on uh, the, the Islamic call to prayer times. And in that period of time, I would actually make prayers for intercession for these particular children. So uh, one of the children had been killed uh, in Kenya when a stray bullet hit him as part of the police brutality we experienced. The other child was from Turkey. Um, and he is the iconic image of a child who washed up on the beach. Um, and then there's several other children as well who unfortunately I think the world has forgotten. Next page, please. As part of my work around public art, so I also strongly believe that art should not only exist in the gallery, but can exist in other ways. I placed the, these five novellas for a series of five days in the national newspaper in the obituary section. Um, and in this way, got people to reflect upon each of these children. In this particular case, this little story is about Jeremy, who was a Kenyan child who, because of the greed for money, the school bus he was traveling in was poorly maintained and he fell through the floor of the school bus and was run over. This work was part of a Circle Arts Gallery show called New Threads, and it refers to grief, apathy, and desensitization. Next slide, please. Wakariro is a work that I created in 2019, and in it, I look at Maumau history, go back to my favorite topic, which is the history of Kenya's period. And I was referring to the erasure of language. So the fact that fewer and fewer Kenyans are speaking their ethnic languages, what it means for uh, memory and what it means, means for culture. So I recreated this house, which is a three stone fire. Um, I don't know how to describe it in English. Again, the importance of language, it's a kariko. So in this kariko, it's a, it's a shed that has got a three stone fire and women traditionally used to cook in this, three, in this shed area. And being a woman, it was an opportunity to discuss with other women what was happening in the neighborhood. It was an opportunity as a, as a young girl to learn from other women as well. This space was not inviting to men in the same way that the kitchen should be not inviting to men. Uh, it was inviting to boys, but a particular age men just didn't go into that space. So it was a safe space that women organized in that space. Um, what I did, I then recorded my mother explaining to me the different types of beans that are found. And what I found is that even by the very naming of this bean in the language that we speak, which is Kikuyu, you have knowledge that is encased in that, just the, the naming of it. And unfortunately, it's lost when it comes to English because you, you, know, you name it red bean or white bean or et cetera, as opposed to the different names, that et cetera. And then I used a song that my grandfather used to sing to me to refer to the collection of memory. So Wakariro, it's this woman who is coming from collecting firewood and she's talking to another girl and she said, come and get me so that you can receive the firewood. So symbolically talking to a future generation and saying, come and get me so that you can collect the knowledge that is uh, encased within the, the language. Next slide, please. So I lifted the kariko, which is the outdoor cooking shed as exactly it as it was presented exactly um, outside my grandmother's house. Initially, my idea had been to use my grandmother's original kariko, but when I suggested that to my own children, my son said no. And I asked him why he said no. When I think of my grandmother, when I remember my grandmother, this my great grandmother in this particular case, uh, this kariko is part of that memory. So I had to recreate it. And uh, one of my cousins who came to see the exhibition actually thought I had lifted the exact kariko that my, my grandmother had. And it was, it was interesting to see how, um, how particular materials right, raise uh, affiliation because people who, you know, 
strangers who came in to see the exhibition were talking about how they had their own experiences within the Kariko and how it was a safe space for them and how they felt like they had been transported to their own uh, grandmother's compounds. On the far right are images of women who fought in the Mau Mau War. And uh, the faces are forgotten. So what I did is I, I traveled around Kenya and I took images of women who had fought in the war. I took their descriptions and their names and then used their faces or their faceless bodies in the uh, in the installation to explain how we have forgotten about these particular women and how we are we cannot access them and their stories if we don't speak that particular language. Next image, please. The Eyes Were Watching is a new work that is currently running. Um, I saw it for the first time today, uh, having been on quarantine after coming in contact with somebody who had corona. And it refers to the hypersexualization dismemberment of the black female body. Um, in it, I have that uh, includes um, um, Indian ink used as scarification. And I've taken image transfers of uh, scientific racists and models of white male beauty and superimpose them such that their eyes meet and then when you look at the work your eyes meet theirs and above them are these dismemberments or things that uh, parts body parts of women that are often referred to black women when you talk about their beauty you talk about their big full breasts or their big buttocks or how black women are not referred to as fully black women but as body parts um, in it as well there is a video um, and the description of women as flowers and how they're described as uh, flora and fauna the work references heavily sarah batman's experience and how she as a human was taken from south africa taken to europe displayed talks and um, then upon her death, how her body parts were dismembered and put into jars that were then studied and used as the basis for uh, why Africans are closer to being apes than any other ethnic group. And at the end of that particular video picture to a young woman called Avin Kinyanjui, who was recently uh, a victim of sexual violence. She was raped and she ended up dying from her injuries and the rape was brutal. And it shows that the person who raped her did not see her for anything but her body parts. Next slide, please. That, those are the works on paper with the scarification, um, black Indian ink with the superimposed images of the, the two scientific racists and the ideals of uh, male male beauty um, and then i used embroidery as a as a symbol of women's labor next slide please i also work on a number of projects um, in the past i have worked on a two-year project with another artist by the name xavier verhust uh, the project was called who i am who we are and it basically was looking at the idea of nationalism uh, despite a heavily ethnic, ethnically fractured society that still suffers the effects of colonialism over 50 years later, I wanted to find out if Kenyans actually felt like they are Kenyan and what it meant to be Kenyan. What was the definition of Kenyan? So we created this um, room called the Silent Room, which is a three meter by three meter by 2.5 meter space and put a chair, a, a headphone and microphone and audio recording system and anybody could come in off the street into the room, close the door, and there'd be an interview on the outside. And anonymously, they could answer a series of questions that ask them, for example, what does it mean to be Kenyan? What are you proud of about being Kenyan? And this project, which took 
um, two years traveled across different parts. So we went to, we looked at ethnic division, we looked at uh, social class, we looked at educational background, and it was a portable structure that went from Nairobi to Kisumu to uh, Lamu, and it looked at race as well, uh, which is a factor that we often forget when we talk about Kenya. It culminated in a book uh, of body maps that are basically art pieces where we took a smaller group of people through a five to seven day um, program and they painted images of themselves. So basically you land the ground, we create an outline of your body and then within that you fill your ideas about what it means to be Kenyan. Next slide please. The work was then shared back with the community as you can see um, with the, the the walk through the work being led by participants of the particular process. So there you have um, images of the silent room in different spaces and also the display of the body works, body maps. Next slide, please. There are lots of videos that I'd have loved to share with you, um, but then I think they're better experienced by yourself. So if you would like to see the videos, um, you can you can go to the Vimea account there, One Boy Camero, and you will see videos from your name betrays you. Uh, from Wakariro, um, and even the eyes were watching, and it, it it then touches on the work and gives a different feel to it. And I think. At, I have run you through select works that I have and you how memory works within my own work, um, how I present memory as an experience, but also as an opportunity to explore uh, your own uh, thoughts um, and to create a different type of conversation other than what is necessarily fed to you by you know media or history books. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so Shukrani much. Sana. Shukrani Sana, that means thank you very much. <laughs> Great. Agre, do you want do you, do you want to facilitate the QA, Agre? Is that uh, is that okay? Yes, that's that's cool. okay. I'm trying to look at the QA so you so can see if they Everybody should have the op the ability to type in in the in the Q and A section any questions you have um, for for one B. Um, so just uh, yeah, thanks. I I actually have a question. If that's okay, if I can start off, can you talk a bit about the um, the art space um, initiative that you do in the online gallery and just how that sort of work with the community and other artists, how that how that sort of informs your practice as some of your social activist work as well? So the art space originally began as um, a physical space. And the idea was to have a, a space where artists can come in, not just show work, but begin to explore topics that might be uh, difficult or that they want to explore, but are not necessarily sellable um, in other uh, galleries because maybe the topic was too heavy or the medium was not something that you know it's not it's not a painting or a sculpture the space actually led to a few changes when you look at the, the kenyan art industry whereby artists have exhibitions and then have opportunities to talk about their own work and that's something that had not been done before um, and and I, I believe that, and I hope that the art space gave Kenyan artists more a more opportunity to own their work, not just to be detached from it. So that you know they create the work and then give it to the gallery, it's sold off, and they, you know they have no connection with it beyond that. They give it to the gallery. Um, I then moved the art space from the physical space because rent prices are too high in this country and decided to go online. And with going online, we've had pop-ups in unusual spaces. So the first pop-up was in a, a, a car sales room. And I was trying to integrate artwork with 
within uh, an unexpected place. Because I, I, like I said earlier, I strongly believe that artwork should not just be encountered within a gallery space. The next work will be held in a showroom, uh, what do you call it, a workshop um, for, that is in an area where there are artisans. Uh, an audience that doesn't necessarily always see artwork or encounter it formally, um, just because I, I, I like to see an interaction of an audience with artwork in a way that raises questions and builds on conversation. So that's what the art space is. Awesome. There's a, there's a couple of um, questions uh, in the chat there. Yeah. I'm seeing um, uh, two questions. I think we'll start from um, one, the, the first one from Sarah Cliff that says, uh, your work is fascinating. Wambui, can you say a little bit more about the productive blurring you do between the public and the private? Um, sorry, I, hmm. uh, Sarah, um, could, would you mind clarifying what you mean by the blurring between the public and the private? Um, I, I'm not sure whether it's in reference to my experiences versus social experiences or would you would you mind? Sarah, I've made you a, I made you a panelist, uh, Sarah, so you can you can uh, activate your voice now if you'd like. Hi, Wembui, can you hear me? Yes, I can, Sarah. Okay, wonderful. Um, I'm well, I'm just intrigued by um, the room you had of uh, the artist undergoing a breakup and bringing the um that shed which seems like a very kind of closed and gendered space um into the art gallery where you, you know uh it just seems like there's so much productive blurring of boundaries um and i just wonder if you could say between the public and the private or between uh the art gallery and what's beyond it um there just seems to be a lot of uh really interesting blurring going on um I really like audience participation in the works, and I think it helps inform or shape the work for me. The work doesn't just stop with me displaying it and people coming to see it. It continues on to conversations um, that influences future works, but it also helps me with processing particular ideas. And I believe and I hope it also helps the audience in processing their ideas. So when we talk about, when we talk about uh, blurring private and public, I don't necessarily see a difference between the two because we're all individuals who are in uh, a larger have your own private experiences that form or create particular memories and that influences how you move within society, which is the public. So I like to lift your private memories and put them into as an audience and put them into this uh, up for display for yourself and also for for others to see so my my work when it comes to the personal work is about looking lifting something out and presenting it to be experienced so that other people's memories can tie into that particular work uh thank you very much love it thank you yeah. thank you sarah we have another comment. Um, it's not a question, it's a comment. Good job, Wambui. Very interesting walk, walk through all your very important different installations. Loving only mom. Bob, my very Bob. big supporter, mom. Thank you, mom. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah. You know, it's a very good motivation. I, like, I really, really love that. Yeah. Then um, this is a question from Angela. Wambui, you mentioned um, in your talk that in Kenya, you don't talk about race. I'm wondering if you can talk a little more about how art is able to facilitate or create space for these conversations. How does these opportunities differ 
in relation to other disciplines? So my background is in history. And when I came back to Kenya, I went to look for a job in one of the major universities here. And I said to them, I, you know, I wanted to be paid peanuts. I just wanted to share some of the stuff that I had seen. And I was interested in people, um, in people learning, um, in people sharing, um, and, and having conversations around, you know, our, our shared Kenyan history. Now, when I talk about the fact that we don't necessarily talk about race in Kenya, it's part of it is because we have other issues that are related to um, ethnic groups. And we don't necessarily see the Kenyan whites or Kenyan Indians as being one of those ethnic groups. Um, and I think that is a handover from colonialism that uh, Africans were only the ones who were black um, and not necessarily anybody else that the British had brought. So the Indians were brought to work on the railroad. And in this particular case, the Indians were brought in according to archival documents as a buffer race so that the British aristocrats could continue to enjoy the fruits of, of Kenya. And then what has happened over time is that you have the British aristocrats or the people who came to fight in the war, who then settled in this country, and then they have uh, consecutive generations of whites. And then you have clusters. So you have, you know, uh, Kenyan whites who are reserved to particular areas, Karen and Yuki, et cetera, et cetera. You have Kenyan Indians who are reserved to, you know, Diamond Plaza area, Parklands. And then you've got the others. And I think because we don't discuss race, then certain ethnic, certain, and I call them ethnic groups actually, interestingly enough, Kenyan whites, Kenyan Asians, certain ethnic groups are left out of politics and um, part of it that allows them to develop their country, which they rightfully have ownership to. So how does this differ um, in relation to other disciplines? Uh, where it co concerns history, I actually borrow a lot of history in my work when it comes to discussing Kenya. Um, when it comes to themes around grief, for example, I borrow a lot from psychology. I also borrow a lot from the social, other social science. I think there's a different, there's an intuition of all the disciplines within the, the, the work that I do. I hope that answers your question, Angela. Um, before we get to another question, I have um, a question. Um, I really, really appreciate what you're doing. And I think you already know that. And your work really does paint a future that is interesting. Um, and very informative. So I'd like you to talk a little bit more about the progressive path of um, post-colonial Kenya uh, in contrast to Western dominant uh, conservative and progressive influences. What those two sides, um, how, we, how do we expect them to, to maybe influence uh, the future of Kenya and Africa? And what role will art have to play in that? Exactly. I'm going to try and answer that question with specific, with specific uh, reference to art. I think as artists, we have the opportunity to create a different perception of Africa. And that's what, uh, that's why I'm interested in the studies of the who is doing the similar work in South America. And I have been, initially my work was in colonialism. And then I realized that all I am doing is referencing this particular time as opposed to pre I as a black woman. And so I, I think art plays a great role for the African continent in terms of defining to us, for ourselves, what it means to be African and what it means to be Black and then what it means to be Cameroonian, Nigerian, whatever the case might be. 
And by answering those questions for ourselves, I think it gives us an opportunity to grow our pride and to write our stories in the way that Wolishi Inka said that the um, that one day uh, Africans will write their own story and that the story of is if it is told through, and I'm paraphrasing what he said, if it is told through the story of the, the lion, it can only be told of the, the, the person who won the war. <laughs> I need to remember the particular uh, way in which he said it, and I, I will in a moment. Um, but I think that as artists, we need to use our work, um, whether it is in painting or in sculpture. Um, and you know, not necessarily as activism, but as descriptions of who we are and where we are in this particular time. So if you paint a bowl of fruit, like the way it had been in, uh, in Europe, a bowl of fruit could have been representative of a particular social circumstance in a particular society. If that is what you do, then what you uh, should, then, then what we should see that work as is not, um, uh, is not is not primitive, is not native, is not necessarily African indigenous work, but as a description a descriptor of a people in a particular time and place. I agree. Does that answer your question? Thank you so much. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Really. Um... An amazing response, and I really love how you um, approach these issues. Um, so there's another question. Um, I really appreciate how you're answering the questions, actually. I'm, I'm enjoying that, and I'm learning a lot from you. <laughs> Very precise. So we are um, so burdened with small um, sweets like tribalism. Also, yeah. Also <laughs> you know. Sorry, it also gives me time to think about the, the work even more. So I'm, I really enjoyed this conversation as well. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's, uh, it's a very fruitful conversation we are having and, and really touching. Um, and there's a comment here uh, from mom and um, I'm going to read it out. Uh, we are so burdened with small sweets like tribalism classes, home guards for colonial days, we just don't have time to talk about race, unfortunately. There is cruelty, a new global wave to speak up and address decolonization of global health. I worry that as Kenyans and Africans who have suffered the brunt of global health colonialism will miss the bus because of what I'm calling small sweets. This really digs deep into what we are discussing and now gives it the perspective from, you know, health perspective and, um, oh man, this is, this is a really powerful conversation. I'd like you to, to think about that, maybe respond to it and say something about it. And the yeah, metaphor of say, small sweets, I really yeah. like that, yeah. I, I should say that uh, my mother is a scientist and so when she, talks about the process of uh, decolonialism um, Angela had asked the question how does this differ in other disciplines I think the process of describing ourselves as Africans it should not also only be left to, to art. It should also be experienced in other fields, whether it is medicine or whether it is how architecture or um, uh, whether it is politics. I, I, I not one one part of it cannot lift it alone. So art alone cannot change how we define ourselves as, as Africans. It, it has to be integrated. But I think art itself uh, opens up the box for conversation. It's a safe space. Uh, it's it's not seen as a threatening space, at least here in Kenya. And because it's not seen as a threatening space, then we can have conversations. That global health or whether it is health when it comes to the African continent and how that fits into uh, global health or whether it is how we build our houses and how that fits into how you know whether we're you know we're fitting into climate change and the, the, you know reduction of emissions uh, based on simply the fact that we're defining ourselves for ourselves and for our needs 
Um, and I think, you know, it, I agree that if we don't begin to see ourselves as um, Africans with our own stories, with um, our own needs, and if we're only uh, answering to the Western world, then that's what we'll be. We'll just be answers to the Western world, but not answers to ourselves and our issues here on the African continent. That's, that's really, um, that's really uh, powerful to look at it that way. There's also something we may have missed. I'd like you to touch on it a little bit. Um, uh, Wambui, could you tell us what drew you away from painting to research and uh, setting installations? Um, maybe you could answer that before I go to another comment from Mary Ogembo. Okay, um, so I started painting. I thought when you join art, you do, you paint. And then luckily uh, the director of Kuona Trust where I was working at the time, Sylvia Gishia suggested that I try uh, installations. So I read up on what installations are. I had always felt limited by the canvas, which is interesting because I've actually gone back to 2D work in, in the new work called Their Eyes Were Watching. Um, and I, I blame my mother for the fact that I, um, I have a, a research-based background and interest. And because I have a research-based background and interest, there's a lot of data that the, the work churns up, which cannot be fit, fitted onto a canvas, a 2D canvas. And I, I, like I said, I like the experience of people within that space and the ability to interact with it, to move work around. I actually don't mind when people move work around to suit how they feel or what they're thinking when it comes to my installation work. And uh, I find I find it sort of like a recapturing of, for, of a space, like a, a occupation of that particular space when you take art into that space and you generate valuable conversations from it. So that's how I move from painting to installation work. I agree. I'm, I'm right back. Um, first, I'll start by saying thank you so much, uh, Mama Wambui. The background you set is amazing and it's perfect. <laughs> and um, so quickly, also I see there's a comment, it's a lot of heavy lifting. I agree with you, Wambui, that's what she added to that. And um, from Mary Ogembo, we have um, in your work, your name betrays you or my image was not being seen. I'm sorry for that. In your work, your name betrays you. What was the viewers' reactions on the tribal stereotypes? Uh, were the remarks approved of as being accurate? That's from Mary Ogembo. So what is interesting about many of those stereotypes is that they're repeated uh, across the, the different ethnic groups. The particular one about being lazy is particular is repeated across different ethnic groups. Now they are factual in that I had talked to correspondents and I had asked them, you know, what would you say about the Kalenjin or you would say about the, the Taita or whatever ethnic group and wrote down what they have heard about this, this particular group. I then also went to other um, articles, so um, historical documents, as well as documents around social sciences that describe these people, and even medical documents as well, you know, because when you talk about, when you look at some medical documents, they say, okay, I work in Kilifi area, and when I work in Kilifi area, I work with the Giriyama people, and the Giriyama people are known to be uh, you know, don't are not interested in education and da, 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 da. So I lifted all these statements. Now, are they true? I don't actually believe they're true. And this is what the, the work um, tries to generate in terms of conversation. Is it that people are acting like the stereotypes because they've been told that's what they are? Or do they act like that and the stereotypes come up? And so the, the work is about the classification of these groups um, from the point of entry from explorers 
who say this is what this person is like, followed by missionaries who you know, cement that idea, followed by colonialists who cement that idea further, and then followed by us who are just reading off of the same long uh, descriptions or book. So are the stereotypes true? They're only as true as people hold them in their heads. Uh, there's no reason why um, Kikuyus don't love fish. There's no reason, except that possibly they have been told time and time again, don't love fish. There's no reason why uh, Luos are the ones who love money. Actually, most people love money because of what it affords people to do. So it's a matter of looking at these stereotypes and thinking twice about them and not just receiving them because that's what you have heard said in private conversation. And that explains for you why a particular group is, where, is acting the way that they do. Counter memory activism. This is a story. This is the other story. Do the two match with your reality? Um, as I told you, I can listen to you talking all night. <laughs> I really love how you uh, bring in that aspect of um, the reality and you know what history um, the different communities have been through, then how you contrast them. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions, but um, I have one question. Um, it's, it's a light-hearted one that um, I'm so curious about. Um, what are the areas that really um, occupy you when, like your journey, when you're doing all this work, where is your mind when you're doing it? Are, are you thinking about the objects and the work you're doing at the moment or what's happening when you're creating? So the process of creation takes one to two years to create. Uh, a lot of it is love research. I love finding out more about a particular topic and having my mind changed by that topic based on the materials I've come across. When I, so the, the, actually for me, the fun part is the research part. And then the easiest part is actually just putting the show together. There are the story, the, the items reveal themselves in a, in a, in a sense. And I learned this through painting, because sometimes when you're painting, the paint is affected by the temperature or uh, by your, you know, the humidity or whatever. You have all these other external factors that mean that your yellow is not going to be the yellow that you wanted, or your your you know, your face is as you're painting your portrait is going to keep widening as opposed to going back and the frustrations that you deal with in managing your materials. I experience the same thing in installations. And I, I tend to imagine myself as an open vessel and open to what the materials will lead me to do. I like everyday objects. Um, I like repetition, like I mentioned, repetition as well. I like scale um, and I um, I like the objects because of the stories it tells you about yourself and it tells you about that particular work. So am I thinking about the materials I'm working with it? Yes, only as far as trying to manipulate it, but not as far as trying to control it because you can't really control the materials. Wow, amazing. Um, now a very related question I'm seeing here from uh, Edwin Naina. Um, hi, Wambui. Uh, love, love your work. Uh, do you see yourself integrating VR into your marvelous installations? I don't know. Um, it's it's uh, it's not something I have thought of. Um, I find that even though I'm working in a, a really untraditional medium, which is installation. I like traditional items. Uh, and there's something about touch and again, the senses and what that does. Um, and so when I, when I mentioned earlier that I work with the six basic senses, I want to create smell, sound, touch and sight, but touch is a very big one for me. So I don't know if I would integrate uh, VR so much, at least not now. That's not something I cannot consider in the future. But you also said you are open to letting the media, you know, take its own course. So you never know. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> never know. And, and, and actually, what I'm really interested in is online misidentity, as I call it. The idea that you live in a parallel uh, universe. So I have my real life, and then I have what I put onto social media, which is a projection of my real life. So in some senses, it is like VR, because there is an image or a portrayal of yourself that you are trying to manipulate and control and present to this other. And um, somehow the two are to new mediums. I'm open to new mediums. Sorry, I don't know what was happening. Yeah, me too. <laughs> but then I, I, at least I got your explanation. Like, you know, it's it's um, um, how you see VR almost like, you know, even social media is giving us that experience already in some way. Um, Margarita and Jerry has, um, I could listen to you all day. Your work is brilliant. I told you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, Margarita. Um, so uh, just a little bit maybe on what you said about social media um, as we are looking to close. I don't know if uh, we can hold it a little longer or we had time, but then I like what you are talking about when you're saying that uh, the self and objects and what the, the things, the traditional things we touch and then uh, how you describe that into, are you still there? Yeah. Oh. There you are. <laughs> <laughs> how you describe that and then you talked about um, social media being some sort of VR in itself, maybe you say a little bit more about that. Um, so I tend to be more of a quiet listener, uh, but more of a participant when it comes to social media. And I, I think one of the future works that I'm going to be looking at is about how we present ourselves on, um, on social media. So I guess it's part of the research process for work that will come up. Um, I am interested in what people use social media for, uh, and then also in watching matching trends. So TikTok, for example, is quite interesting in that when you have a how does it matter whether you're from the Philippines or you're from Canada or wherever it is, you're part of this uh, grouping and what that means for, um, the need for identifying or the need for being affiliated with a particular group of people and how, what that how, you know, does that in any way refer to how society has become lonelier and lonelier is social media the new place where you find affiliations around away from um from society and then how does that affect your everyday life your are you the same person online as you are offline so i i, I it's it's a process in looking at, I guess, the social, psychological, um, and emotional effects of social media and how that bends a person. Um, I, I am this person in real life, but this is the person I aspire to be. And I'm gonna create this other person. And what that means when people meet you online before they meet you uh, in real life. Um, I, I, I'm just watching it from now. I'm just watching it for now. And I, I'm sure it's going to appear in some sort of work in, in some way. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much. I really, really appreciate it. Shukrani, Shukrani Sana, um, to everyone listening who can hear what those words mean. Uh, those who don't, that means um, I really appreciate it. <laughs> um, Thank Maybe you so. as well for the opportunity. Um, I, I, it's been a while since I actually worked on my portfolio. So this kind of forced me to do so. I look at my work in 
in its entirety. And I thank you for the opportunity to interact with a different audience and to get, you know, some of the thinking around, um, you know, around what's happening with art. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you so much. And, you know, hopefully one day we'll meet in person. We could do, we could do some sort of VR thing in Halifax. <laughs> <laughs> we do have a VR suite. We could have VR residency for you here. So anyway. no, I'm interested in the real thing. I, I want to see this place. I'm interested in the real thing. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it's, it was, I, I also could listen to you all day, but I know it's like one in the morning for you now, bro. <laughs> it's 12.30. Oh, it's oh, it's early. I wonder how, how this is going to, how this is going to mess up with my clock tomorrow and the rest of the days. But it's, just... <laughs> it's still early. It's still early. Anyways, I, I, we should let, we should let you go, but, but we'll, but the conversation will continue and we hope to, you know, we hope to continue this conversation in the future. Like I said, we've got three years of this grant, so we'll, we will hopefully see each other again. <laughs> that yeah. would be fantastic. Yeah. And, and Agre, thank you so much again, so much for your facilitation. I think you're still there. Are you still there, Agre? Yes, I'm still here. Okay. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you so much, everybody for coming. Uh, for us with us tonight and joining us um and from all over the world looks like we have people from everywhere so it's pretty pretty wild it's so great that everyone joined us from all over the place and uh and just so you know we have recorded this conversation and um it will be available online if you want to review anything that was mentioned and um yeah is there any final words that either 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 of you want to want to say before we conclude i think i i am so happy to find uh, a group of people who are looking at memory. I've been feeling like I'm floating alone on an island uh, when it comes to memory work and art. So thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you again. And your work is, well, thank you for sharing your work. And well, like I said, we'll continue the conversation for sure. And, uh, and, and everyone, everyone, all, everyone in Nairobi, or I think people are from, there's people from all over the place uh, joining us. Everyone have a wonderful evening or day, I guess, depending where you are. And uh, and reminder that next week we have Sylvia Hamilton joining us. And um, and just uh, if you want more information about our about our series, go on go on Facebook. All the all the information is there. Countermemoryactivism.ca. And we will uh, yeah we will see every everybody again soon. And have a wonderful night, everybody. Thank you for joining us and thank you so much. Awesome. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.